God our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. May the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God our Savior desires all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. People probably get sick of hearing about the truth around here. Good, as far as I'm concerned, because if you start getting sick of hearing about it, and I hear you're sick about hearing about it, I know you know it, it will be good. That's what the whole thing is about, is us learning God's truth. I always emphasize truth in its entirety, because this, if we can talk about truth in the abstract, we could talk about general theological truths and tease that out a little bit, but there's a reason for that. I always emphasize the necessity of living our faith. That's practical Catholicism. To know the truth is practical. We're going to see today what I mean by that. I'm not going to harp on the truth today. Aside from saying the fact is laying the foundation that we have to appreciate God's truth and his whole truth because it's God's. You know, the old consider the source. It's God who has given it to us. He wants us to know it, not in part, not in my opinion of it, but what he has said through the big three that I'm always harping about, scripture, tradition, and the continual teaching of the magisterium of the church. You don't have to, when I talk about knowing God's truth, you do not have to be an apologist or one who defends the Catholic faith. The truth does not need you to defend it. St. Augustine, who has a bunch of really cool quotes, a quote about the truth that I just love from St. Augustine. He says, truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose. It will defend itself. That's what we need to do with the truth. We let the truth loose by understanding it, the whole thing, by proclaiming it, particularly in the face of those who would deny it. Not deny it because they deny truth because they don't know it. They don't know it in all its fullness. We need to live and proclaim and let out, let loose the whole truth the truths that are communicated to us by the Holy Spirit through those three conduits, scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. We live in a society that always likes to ask why. Why this? Why that? Why does the church do that? Why don't they do this in this parish? Everybody else does it. Why don't they? We don't do this. Why do they do that? You know what? It's not some abstract, ethereal discussion. You know what he can say? Because God says so. I always say, flee from this, I think this, or my opinion is this, or we do this. No. Appeal to God. Appeal to God in his truth. Why? Because if you're not, <laughs> their argument is not with you. It's with God. That's all there is to it. And that's all you need to say. Let it loose. It will defend itself. Because all the, if, and make them check you out. All right? Would you, would, and then there are, they either have to come to the conclusion of one of two things. They're either going to say, my opinion holds more weight than what God says. I would submit to them that that's extremely dangerous. Or they have to acquiesce. And just say, okay, that's what he says, but that one little word for the past 60 years has decimated the church. Oh, yeah, we believe that, but that little word, but you would think it would be no big deal. It is a tremendous deal. And so I was going to go practical about this today. Two aspects of the practicality. One. We get visitors who come here, and when they see things, <laughs> and somebody come in, was talking to her this week. She's been coming to daily mass. 
and she goes, you know, I drove, I was driving by, and I looked over, it's, that's a Catholic church? I didn't know it was a Catholic church. So I turned around because I was on my way and I didn't know if I was gonna make mass at this other place. So I came in and she said, I walked in here and I said, this doesn't look like a Catholic church. You know why a person would say in this day and age, it doesn't look like a Catholic church? Because it looks like a Catholic church. <laughs> that, that, you know, we gotta, you just have to, pre that's what we're dealing with. Because they just don't know. One of the things that stands out in people's minds when they come in here, the fact they don't have girl altar servers, they don't have women read. Why? Let's find out. I'm not going to say anything about it. That's the question. Why doesn't that happen? That second reading from today, first letter of St. Paul to Timothy, chapter 2. You know, I always say, take notes, check this stuff out. If there was ever a day to do it, I want you to do it on this one, because this is a hot button issue in our day and age, because not only, I said we're gonna hit this from two aspects, not only what goes on in here in these four walls and the whys, and I'll submit to you this, that it's not because we're stodgy and old fashioned, it's not about traditionalism. You will see the why and why we do this and why people that are of like minds do this or don't do other things. Another thing is a tremendously public and from a whole lot of circles, tremendously embraced discussion now is, oh, let's have a committee to see if we can ordain women to the diaconate. I will submit this to you, you know, the answer that, well, why? Okay, that's going to be answered in what we hear also. But <laughs> you're going to have a committee. You're going to spend a lot of money flying a lot of bishops and a lot of theologians <laughs> to Rome to discuss something that after I go through this, I'll submit that's a waste of money to discuss a question. Let's just see if we can do that. Okay? You can't. But whether they do or not, that's not, that's not my deal. I'm just gonna tell you what it said, what God says. In that second reading today, 1 Timothy chapter two, there are 15 verses, 15. The reading today is one through eight, okay? It is about, this is the context, and everything in scripture is about context. You can't tease it out to make it say something that it doesn't about something else. The context of what Paul is talking about are general instructions concerning public liturgical assemblies. Public liturgical assemblies. It is about context. And we're going to get into what Paul says about the context. And here, let's just set the stage. He is going to answer our questions about whether, you know, why don't women do those things in this parish or in other parishes of like mind? And should we ask the question as to they could, could they be ordained to the diaconate? Remember, public liturgical assemblies, not society, not roles in society, not what women can do out there, not what they can do in a seminary classroom, not what they could do in classrooms in a parish, Public liturgical assemblies, okay? Uh, an example, there is a woman in this parish and some of you pro will probably know who I, of whom I speak when I say, there is a woman in this parish who disdains any time a woman is in doing something in worship that they ought not, disdains it. It is very vocal about her disdain of women doing that. She is a cop. Okay, you know, so she doesn't have this women should stay in the house thing going on, all right? She's a cop and she hates it when women in the church do something they're not supposed to, all right? So it's context, so let's just keep it there. Those three things, again, and let's beg the question, why don't you allow that in this parish? And the question, can women be ordained to the diaconate? Do you have to send a bunch of people to Rome to discuss it? 
Scripture, tradition, the magisterial teachings of the church. Scripture. And this is one of those incidents where we don't get into this because the second reading, I didn't hear anything about women in there. No, you did not. It is Paul's instructions concerning public worship. And after a big salutation about the glories of Christ and driving this home in the fact that this is what God wants and he has appointed me, St. Paul, to be a teacher of this doctrine, that we get, I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Period. That's the first sentence. Okay, that's very palatable to the salad bar theology of our day and age. I like this, I don't like that, I like this. We like that. I like this thing about praying and with holy hands and not being angry. Well, the unity of the church, we like that. We like when Paul says that he desires prayers to be said for all men. Everybody. Not just people you like, not just your family, but everyone. And for everybody in government. Not just the ones you like. You know, you ought to be praying for more for the ones you don't like because you should be voting according to your Catholic faith anyway, so the ones that you're not voting for, you should pray for them more because obviously they don't get your Catholic vote, so they need to be Catholics. There's actually a, I was having a discussion with our resident history professor, and I mean that literally, UCF history professor, Dr. Tom Greenhall. And we were talking this week, and he, he pointed out something uh, about intercessory prayer, and he said there was a, uh, an Anglican bishop in, England during World War II and he was chastised tremendously because during his intercessory prayers during the beginning of World War II he prayed for Adolf Hitler people were aghast how dare you if you really think about it who needed prayer more on the face of this planet than Adolf Hitler for his conversion he's just doing what he's supposed to do and what God says that we're supposed to do and there was an uproar over that we're supposed to pray for all people in government. We like that now. We're merciful. You know, you open a, a newspaper, turn on a we're, we're all about mercy. All right? So we like that too. So we like praying for people. We like unity in the church. We like government. Yeah, that's the like parts in the holy buffet. The passage goes on, and he says, women, again, in the context of public liturgical assemblies, Women, I'm going to condense it, I know we have limited time. Women, when you come to public worship, dress conservatively, modestly, okay? We should do that sort of across the board. We should always be conservative and modest. You know, we should never be going overboard. But particularly in here, this is about coming and worshiping God, not, hey, look what I have, hey, look how pretty I am. Okay, why did he say that about men? Men aren't really known for braiding their hair, wearing jewelry, and dutying themselves up. So Paul, you know, it's always been that way throughout history. Paul's women, when you come into the parish, modesty, conservatism. He goes on. Learn in silence. You're not permitted to teach. The last time I looked, one of the primary functions of a deacon is to teach, not permitted to teach, nor to have authority over a man. The last time I looked, deacons were clerics. They have authority over people who they have charge. And if that was, for instance, this place, I'm looking out here, there's a lot of men over whom a woman would have authority. Pretty clear. And then this. And yes, it's repetitive. So the Holy Spirit really means it. She is to keep silent. Do not come away from this that the Holy Spirit saying, women, you need to sit in there and shut up and just listen. What he's trying to communicate is the fact that the church has a magisterium. The church has a magisterium, and the magisterium teaches. There is a teaching office in the church. And that teaching office of the church is open to men. Why? Our God is a God of order. Always has been. From the time of creation, he is a God of order. Light, darkness. 
sea, land, male, female. He's a God of order. He's a God of roles. This is your role. This is your role. You are equal, but you have this role. You have that role. Paul's just taking it into the church. That's what scripture says. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? Okay. Well, in the traditions of the church, and scripture even says there were deaconesses in the apples and oranges. The deaconesses that are described in scripture in an early church history were not functioning liturgically. They had no responsibilities at the altar whatsoever. They were supposed to prepare young women for baptism. A service, a deacon, a diaconate, a deacon. We are not discussing whether or not, because that would go real far. Oh, let's have a committee to see if women can teach young women about baptism and what they need to know, catechize young women. That's not what the progressives want. That wouldn't go, that wouldn't go anywhere. We're not talking about that. We're talking about slapping on a collar and getting up here and being deacons. That's the question. So the role of a deacon today is nothing what it was in the early church when we read about deaconesses. So get that out of your mind. How do you know that? You weren't there at the early church. No, I wasn't, but Tertullian was. Tertullian, second century. Second century. It doesn't get much earlier in the church than the second century, aside when Jesus was here and his apostles. Tertullian, we do not permit a woman to teach, nor to baptize, nor to take or claim to herself any part of the duty which belongs to man. That's what the early church teaches about that. That kind of pulls the rug out from under, well, there are just women deacons everywhere in the early church. Obviously not. The magisterial teachings of the church. What is the magisterium of the church always said about this? We have catechisms that constantly are added to as we go through time. They add to. We don't ever change church teaching. It is added to. The magisterial teachings of the church in the catechism of the Catholic Church. Oh, you always recite the old ones. No, this is the new one. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1577, 1577. Only a baptized man validly receives sacred ordination. The Lord Jesus chose men to form the College of Apostles, and the Apostles did the same when they chose collaborators to succeed them. For this reason, the ordination of women is not possible. For this reason, the ordination of women is not possible. What is to be discussed? I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but this is pretty clear to me. I always like it they refer to, I say, you know, this part is left out of the reading today. Why? Because it's considered in the in the discussion as a difficult passage. Difficult for what? I, I'm, like I said, I'm a simple guy, and it's pretty crystalline to me. What's difficult about understanding that? You know who it's difficult for? People who want to violate what God says. People who want to go outside the parameters. And the last time we said, you know, we always define sin as any lack of conformity to or violation of the revealed will of God. Scripture, tradition, or the magisterium. That is the definition of sin. So it's difficult for sinners who want to violate it and not conform to it. That's for whom it is difficult. Why isn't that, why wasn't that part read? That is the context of what Paul is speaking about to Timothy. And it's not read. Why? That's not alike on the salad bar. That doesn't conform with the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ 
in the gospel today says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Everybody likes to get myopic on that mammon thing and say, that's money. That's money. We shouldn't, you know, you can't pay attention to God and money. It's anything in this world. Anything that you prioritize over him. You cannot serve God in the whims of this world, whether it be money or what they believe, their whim and will. You cannot serve God and the world. You will either hate one and love the other, or you despise one and adhere to the other. You cannot have both. You can't say scripture this, scripture that. What, what does it communicate to our kids when we say, well, the scriptures say don't do this. You know, the scriptures say don't steal. The scriptures say do that. You know, and then if they actually start reading this, and they go, yeah, scripture says that women are supposed to remain silent in the church, and every single time I go in there, women read everything but the gospel. What do you tell your kid? Well, that part of the script, we can fudge that one a little bit. He doesn't really mean what he says two times that women should be in silence in public worship. Are you saying women shouldn't be readers? I'm not saying a thing. We heard all kind of arguments against what God says. St. Paul's a misogynist. He's the president of the He-Man Woman Haters Club. St. <laughs> Paul is not giving a personal opinion. It's just the, St. Paul is just the opposite. St. Paul is really fringy for his day when it comes to women. St. Paul, Pharisee of Pharisees. He's uber Jew. All right? This guy knows Judaism. From whence this guy comes in the synagogue, men sit over here, women sit over here. There has to be a quorum of men for public prayer to take place. This place could be packed with women. And if there wasn't a quorum of men, public prayer doesn't take place. That's how women were viewed. They could be given a letter of divorcement because the soup was cold when you got home, or just because. He could turn them out. St. Paul is adamantly against that. He emphasizes the essential quality of women. Right here, in this passage, where he's given these prohibitions, he says, I desire that in every place that men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling, the unity of the church, women, He's equating them with the men who are together worshiping. There doesn't have to be a quorum anymore. In Galatians chapter 3, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Essentially, everybody is the same. There are different roles. Well, there shouldn't be. There is in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Father begets the Son. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Father sends the Son to die for our sins. The Holy Spirit teaches us about the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. They have different roles. They are the same. We emphasize that continually. The oneness of the Trinity. They are essentially the same. They are all equally God. Men and women are equally human beings. They have different roles. And those different roles are to be manifest first and foremost in the church. Not because I say, because St. Paul says. St. Paul, he lauds individual women. Priscilla, Lydia. He emphasizes their help for the church. Well, he might not be a misogynist, but those are sociological arguments. They're for his culture. We know better now. He actually gives the reason why. He actually gives us the reason. So we don't have to think about that. And it's not sociological. It's not cultural. It's theological. St. Paul sets the prohibition in the divine plan of creation. For Adam was formed first and then Eve. The role thing. And then he kind of emphasizes this aspect of it. He grounds it in the account of the fall. Adam was not deceived. 
but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. It's punitive. There's a punitive aspect of this all. That's not fair. I wasn't the one that sinned. I shouldn't have. That would be like me getting up here and saying, that's not fair. I had original sin. I didn't eat the fruit. Who's the arbiter of fair? God. And there are consequences when we fall. And sometimes they are tremendously profound. You know, you look, the, he, he, I was reading one commentator about this particular passage, and it was a, he was emphasizing the prohibition of women teaching. And he said, the first time that anything was ever taught on the face of creation, it was taught by a woman. And the teaching was, the fruit's good to the eye and it tastes good. Fail that teaching test. And there are consequences to this. And you can come back and say, oh, okay, all the, you're just too rigid. That's a term that's used quite frequently, that I hear quite frequently. You're too rigid. In a, heck, this week, a hierarch in the church actually told some new bishops that, you know, to be wary of seminarians that are too rigid. What if you have a teenager and you say, okay, you're a new driver, you're 16 years old, yes, you can take the car, be in this house at midnight. I mean it, be in this house at midnight, and you're a parent and you're standing there and it's midnight, 12.30, one, two, three, you got that nauseous feeling in your stomach and the little one comes rolling in at 3.30 and you go, I told you to be in at midnight. Well, even the hierarchs of the church say that we shouldn't be too rigid when we're told something. Uh, yeah, see how far that gets you. <laughs> it, it's for our betterment. It's God's truth. It's God's you know, it, 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 My dad, I wish I had a dime for every time I looked at my father and said, why? And he said, because I said so. <laughs> if you questioned that, it took it to the next level. That was always good for me, because I said so. If it was good enough for my earthly father, a man of sin and fallenness, good guy, <laughs> but a fallen creature just like all of us, if it was good enough for him to look at me and say, because I said so, how much more? Should we, as obedient Catholics, look at what God says, and if we can't work it out in our own minds, if we just don't like it, to look at him and have him go, because I said so, and just be good with that? Why can't we do that? We're talking about God who desires all to come to the truth. And to St. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who is appointed to be a teacher of truth, and he says, I desire this in every place. Not if it's good for this parish, if it's not good for that parish, they don't have to do it. I desire this in every place. And then he goes through the list of what he desires in public worship. This is God's truth. But unfortunately, it's a truth that will not be read in worship. It will not be taught. It is not being followed to a lesser or greater extent in almost every Catholic parish on this planet, and it is being openly questioned by the highest authorities of the church. What do you do with that? You know what you do with it? You appeal to God's truth. Anybody wants to argue with you about this, you don't have to, the only thing you have to remember, 1 Timothy chapter two, <laughs> leave that in your pocket, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter two, because God says so. The truth is like a lion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.